Great, great. Thank you, Scott, and welcome everybody to uh, the future of immersive learning. Where is virtual reality headed? Desktop or headset? And uh, many of you know me in virtual worlds like OpenSim, Kitely, and Second Life, um, where I serve as a librarian, um, hence the name the Librarian, um, and I'm the director of the Community Virtual Library, as someone mentioned. I have been researching virtual worlds now for librarianship and education since 2006. Virtual en environments, I truly believe, hold great potential. And I like to say that whether or not one has an avatar, we all live in virtual worlds. Just take a look around you everywhere you go. People are staring at their phones in cafes, on street corners. They're elsewhere. They're in a virtual space. So we really all live in virtual worlds, maybe not the same type of virtual world. Um, even the youngest among us are active in virtual environments. So I'd like you to type in the text chat if you can think of uh, a name of virtual environment where younger students like say, kindergarten through 12th, K-12 students can experience immersive learning. Can somebody type an environment that you think is uh, being used by the youngest of students? Minecraft, I thought it would come up. Minecraft is definitely one of the um, early um, virtual worlds for young people. I almost call it the kindergarten of virtual worlds because you can build with those blocks. And I see, I think it's Viwol that Day is um, putting in the text chat. And I know there are many, many other virtual worlds that are really great for um, the K-12 students. But where have we been so far in virtual worlds? As I look back over the many years that I've been involved in a virtual world, there's a slide up here that kind of shows the virtual, the community virtual library in Second Life. Um, but where have we actually been virtually? Second Life has been around for many years, at least 15 years. Yet recently, I met some educators in a virtual reality space with a virtual reality headset, and they were educators exploring and they had no idea about Second Life. They didn't even realize that there were virtual worlds out there. So I think these headsets that are coming on the market now are raising the potential to think about virtual environments, but a lot of people don't realize they've been around for over 15 years. In fact, I spoke with Daniel Dybowski Bryant. Some of you may have met him um, at a conference in Second Life for Vicara, which is the Virtual Center for Archives and Records Administration. That's part of San Jose State University. And they've been in Second Life for over a decade. Well, I spoke at a, at a conference with Daniel. We both were um, keynote speakers at Vicara. He's the leader of the uh, virtual the educators in virtual reality Facebook group and the educate educators in VR um, group on Discord and several other spaces. Uh, he lives in the UK. Daniel had no idea of all the tools that are available in a space like Second Life. He was kind of blown away by that. So I found that kind of amazing that Daniel was impressed by Second Life and had no idea it even existed. I was amazed that people in virtual reality wouldn't know about virtual worlds. Um, I'll put the, I'll put this in checks, text chat. This is the conference in Vicara. And some of you may have bumped into Daniel if you're interested in education, um, in educators in VR. So as director of the Community Virtual Library, we have our main branch in Second Life. And uh, Scott mentioned that earlier, that the Community Virtual Library is a real library in a virtual world. We have many um, librarians who have served there throughout the years um, with, with different programs that you would find at a public library, an academic library, a, you know, a school library, or any kind of special library. So. Um, <clears throat> I firmly believe that virtual spaces should be sustainable. And if we are in active in virtual spaces, we should be building sustainable communities for learning. So I've been asking myself as I do this research, where do virtual worlds and virtual reality intersect? Are they both virtual reality? Will they merge one day? 
or are they going to remain two completely different animals? Let's think about that for a minute. We all know that virtual reality headsets are now coming down in price and they're entering mainstream education. Um, I'm wondering how many of you have actually put on a virtual reality headset and, uh, and tried it. And so I thought, here we are in yet another virtual environment. And I'm finding Verbella quite um, user friendly. It was pretty, um, pretty quick for me to figure out how to walk around and learn here. So I'm going to see just how easy it is for all of you to walk around and learn here. I'm going to ask you to stand up and walk over. If you have used a virtual reality headset, would you walk over here uh, to the wall that I'm going to walk to and just stand up over this side of the room? Because I want to see how many of you have tried a virtual reality headset. And if you have not tried one, you can, um, you can remain at your seat just to see how many have tried it. All right, I'm seeing people get up and move around. And guess what? I'm going to include Google Cardboard. If you don't have to have used a, um, you know, a great big uh, Oculus Rift or Rift S or Samsung Gear or any of those, great. People are walking over here. So some of you have used a Google Heart Cardboard or a VR headset of some of some kind. All right, excellent. And I'm going to ask you to type in the text chat what kind of a VR headset you use, just so I can get a variety of, of use. And then I'll ask you to walk back to your seats and take a seat. And let's check the text chat so we can see. Okay, I see an Oculus Rift in here, Oculus Go, Google Cardboard. Um, excellent. So a lot of you have tried some of the, the headsets that are available now. Looks like many of you have. So as you're going back to take your, your seats, I'd like you then to look up at the slide I have up here. When I first started thinking about virtual reality and, and, and what is virtual reality, the father of virtual reality, Jaron Lanier, who's some people call the father of virtual re reality, recently wrote a book where he gave 51 different definitions of it. I think he was kidding around, but really it is difficult to define. Um, and so as uh, I, I created this flow chart, I was thinking about virtual reality headsets and virtual worlds and how they're both really part of virtual reality. I have been to quite a few virtual reality demos because I live in Seattle and it's fairly, it's a fairly high tech town and they're constantly bringing people in from around the globe to do VR um, demos. And most of the VR experience that I have tried out that developers are creating, very few are really high quality educational, <laughs> but most of them are gaming and most of them are first person. So I felt like they were meant to be a one time experience. Go in and do this and then you're done with that one. And you can go out and have some fun and try a different one. So I've kind of come to call those one time VR headset experiences. Oh, cool. I'm, I'm flying through the air on this roller coaster. I call those disposable experiences. And um, I'll just put in the text chat a, a blog post I did when I was first considering this, the difference between sustainable VR platforms and disposable experiences. Um, I wanted to mention that um, there are these educators in VR groups, and I mentioned that uh, Daniel the, is the leader of educators in VR. That group meets in alt space. Type a Y if you've heard of Altspace or you've actually visited Altspace, because I'm interested in how many of you might have been there. Okay, you're all familiar with Altspace. So I put a slide up here about, about educators in VR. And I think it's, it's great that there are educators that are interested in this and they're collaborating, collaborating and networking. But um, the sessions that I have attended, oh, and they also have a Discord channel. A lot of the educators in VR use Discord to connect and, um, and interact because it's also a good tool for, um, for voice and text. Some of these VR worlds don't have good voice. Some ha don't even have a good text. Um, you can't IM each other, and they're all different, which is you know, part of the disadvantages of exploring all these virtual environments. But the, se the sessions that I have tend attended so far have made me realize just how awesome virtual worlds are and how many great tools are right at our fingertips in worlds like Second Life and OpenSim.
I've yet to find a VR headset world that has all of those tools available for us. We can, um, in a virtual world, uh, based on the same source code as Second Life, we can not only use chat and voice and send instant messages, but there are so many other tools just embedded right into the platform, taking pictures, being able to um, import and export our own content. And a lot of that is a little bit difficult to do in a VR platform. So when I went into one VR meeting, I was not able to talk at all. And there was no way to chat to anybody around in the group. The only way to talk was to take the mic, and then I felt completely like I was interrupting the group. So it was like being in a in a in a classroom with you know a muffle over my mouth and my hands kind of tied, and I'm just looking around. Um, also, I'm wondering how many of you who have been in some of the VR um, headset environments have you found that. Um, it's not as creative with an avatar as it can be in a virtual world. When you look at the avatars in this Educators in VR alt space um, slide, there was very little customization of an avatar. And when you've been in virtual worlds for quite a while, you really become attached to your avatar. And so I'm wondering if you would type in text chat if you found that a little bit difficult to go in and just have everyone look the same as either a, a cartoon or a, um, a certain color. You can maybe color your avatar, but that's really the only way that you're able to change the design. Yes, and certainly for alt space. But many of these virtual worlds um, that are virtual VR social rooms, they call them VR social platforms. Uh, don't allow very much customization. In fact, if you have an Oculus, have you noticed that you only have half a body and you're sort of just a light beam on top of, you just kind of situate your avatar on top of a light beam, which is kind of interesting. And um, when you see yourself, when I first went in and met another colleague in Oculus and realized I hadn't even seen myself yet, but I saw the other av avatar and it was a little like the uncanny valley because I had worked with this person quite a bit and then seeing her in this different way and her voice was a little bit amplified, it, it was quite an uncanny valley moment. Yes, the sense of self, um, I think uh, we are, having been in a virtual world for a long time, you understand how your identity is important and we'll get to that in a few minutes. But uh, we do like to be able to have creativity and avatar customization. So this slide is just one example of a social VR space for education that's primarily accessed on a VR headset. But you can also access some of these new VR spaces on a desktop as well. So as I've been viewing the differences in VR and virtual worlds, um, one of the things that we really think about is the idea of the first person and the idea of the third person. Being able to see everyone or just see, you know, or see your avatar as well as everyone. And that the way you're viewing really does impact how you can feel that it is a real space. Um, and I think these worlds do overlap because, as I said, some of them can be social spaces where you interact with a lot of people, but a lot of them are meant to just be explored all by yourself. Now, that's not to say that you can't learn um, completely by yourself. I think we can. Um, I think sometimes it's important to come inside something to, to view it. Say when you're going inside the human body and you want to explore that. Sometimes we want to go inside something by ourselves and explore it. Other times, we want to go inside something and be with other people because when we are inside um, a, real, a reality space and we're immersed with other people, that's where we really get that sense of presence with others. So it's really important that we have the opportunity to do both of those inside our virtual environments. But whatever environment we choose, whatever learning, immersive learning environment it is in a virtual space, I think the most important thing we need to think about before we go into it is having a clear purpose and clear learning objectives as educators. 
just going into VR, and, and I've shown, when I got my Oculus, I, uh, I had a, a visitor come over, and I, I put it on him, and he was blown away. And this guy actually is a Hollywood producer who's worked in film for many years. And when he got inside the Oculus and he looked around, he's like, I, I, can't, I can't even believe this. He said, I've never seen anything like this. I've never experienced anything like this. Because, you know, a movie producer has always looked at everything from thinking about what it'll look like on the screen in front of you, but not what it would be look like to be immersed in it. And so, you know, it, it kind of blew his mind. And I think that happens so many times when people put on a headset. They're blown away by what it looks like, but they don't really have a clear purpose, and they don't have any learning objectives. They're just going, oh, wow, this is beautiful. Nothing wrong with that. But as educators, we need to, we need to go past that and not just say, oh, wow, this is cool and beautiful. But what are we here to learn? So look at the slide I just put up. Um, can anyone recognize the place in this image? This is an immersing, immersive space, VR, that does have a clear learning um, purpose. And uh, it goes beyond, oh, wow, I'm swimming with some fish in the ocean. Cool. That's not really a deep learning experience. Um, there's a little arrow on the screen that's pointing to something, too. And I'd like you to look and see uh, if, you, if you know what that arrow is pointing to. And of course, Spiff can, can tell what it is. <laughs> Yes, Day says it's her diary. It's the aunt, the diary of Anne Frank, and Oculus has a room built that shows um, the cramped quarters um, and the Anne Frank house, uh, and you can go in there and and look at it um, and uh, look at the diary, and it's it's very realistic. You put on the headset, and there you are. But as I went into this, and by the way, if you have, if, if you have it um, on your computer, it's going to eat up your hard drive. Boy, did I learn that quickly. It's like all these gigs it takes for one of these games. And then I heard that you can get the other Oculus where it's all just in the headset. But whatever you get, it's, you kind of need to investigate how much space it's going to take because these programs really do take up a lot of space. Um, there's, there's a lot in this VR space that you can see. I'm getting a message here. Uh, okay. And um, certainly historical simulations are great deep learning experiences. And as a librarian, I, I sort of view this as entering the book instead of only reading the words. And someone in chat said, oh, people won't ever want to just look at a movie screen again when they can get inside movies. Well, I think there's a a place for all of these. There's a place for a movie. There's a place certainly for a physical book. But there's also a place for a VR headset and a place for a virtual world. We need to figure out the best use for each one. And as you look at this slide here, Anne Frank's story is, is a story that has impacted students for many, many years now. But is it really necessary to have a VR headset? Spiff Andrew Wheelock, right here, you know, built an Anne Frank virtual world experience years ago, and I participated in it years ago. And it was incredible because the particip participants could enter it together, and it had clear learning objectives and clear student assignments. Plus, those of you that have ever tr have tried a VR headset, do you find them a bit uncomfortable after a certain length of time? I can stay with the oculus headset on for about 45 minutes and then it, it starts to get a bit uncomfortable for me it gets kind of weird but i could be in a virtual world for as long as any event lasts i can be in for a whole conference that's a whole day long and take little breaks or as long as the learning experience takes so in a way there are times when i don't want to be trapped in that headset so I don't know that the, I mean, maybe for a one-time look at Anne Frank's room, but not to go in and do learning assignments and spend all, a lot of time. So it's sort of, you know, I, I look back at what Spiff did with, with Anne Frank, and I really think it was better than what I what used up all my hard drive with Anne Frank. Just, just a little point. So, um, yes, yeah, so I'm seeing in the, in the text chat that uh, the scene moves very fast, you can get motion sickness. You know, when you crash in a virtual world, you're like, oh dear, everything just crashed, you have to relog. I crashed in VR and all the things that were falling around me really did kind of make me feel a bit nauseous. The world just started going crazy all around me. And um, I think that was, that was a little odd. 
Um, of course, all of these things are going to improve and, you know, they'll iron the bugs out. We're still in the early stages. I'm sure all of you would agree. So let's think about for a minute where we are with the advantages and the disadvantages of the virtual spaces that we have to utilize right now. First, if you think about virtual worlds, I came up with six advantage, six just points that I think you might agree with that are important to me. And let's see if you agree that these are important to you. Type a Y in text chat. It's important to you that users can build. Because I think that's an important thing that for learning, there is so much great opportunity when you can create and build a lot of content. So I'm seeing lots of yeses. That is an advantage we have in virtual worlds like Second Life and Open Sim. And then we, I'm, I kind of alluded to the fact that a lot of these VR social worlds have cartoon avatars that you can't personalize. How many of you as educators feel it's important to have a persistent virtual identity? Which, and what I mean by that is, I use the same name, and I recognize a lot of you by your avatar in virtual worlds if you use certain things to identify yourself. Like, I often have those books on my head, and people, people have found me. They're like, oh, there you are. And if I ever go to a costume party or something and wear something different, people are like, oh, wow, where are your books? You, your virtual identity becomes you. And you're the same everywhere, like Lyra is, of course. She's the same everywhere, even in, in the physical world. And that is important to us after a number of years of um, realizing the advantages of vir virtual worlds. And then what about sustainable communities? How many of you are involved in communities that are so important to you that you do not want to lose those? And when you put on a VR headset, you, you know, are they going to come to all these different platforms? I don't know, but those virtual communities are learning communities and they're, they're, we want those to be sustainable. I would not want to lose those virtual communities. And uh, so that's just something that we have right now that's a huge advantage. And then what about, we mentioned that comfort level. Would you type in text chat about if you've experienced the VR headsets, how long is the maximum that you really feel like you like to you like to stay in? What would you know? You probably could stay longer, but what's the maximum that really is your comfort zone on how long you can stay in? Because and Buffy's saying thirty minutes because the comfort level in a, when you have a a desktop virtual world where you have that distance between your eyes and the screen. The comfort level can be extended for long periods of time and you can move your body around without worrying about bumping into the screen or bumping into your closet door or whatever. So there is a much higher comfort level. So Jenny says only 10 minutes. So yes, I'm seeing different ones that from up to an hour as low as 10 minutes up to an hour. So obviously our comfort level is much longer in a, in a virtual world. For me, I really appreciate that distance between my my head and the screen. And I feel after having, you know, a few years of experience and getting over kind of that learning curve, I feel just as immersed in a virtual world as I do with a VR headset. It's simply a matter of, of getting over the, oh, this is cool syndrome and just being in the moment of where you are. So, and then it's like, they're both, they're both VR to me. Um, and yes, you'll shoot your eye out, Scott, <laughs> just like in a Christmas story, you're going to ruin your eyes. Um, we don't know about that. I think research is, is going to show us um, a little bit more about the long-term effects. Also, what we have that's really important in virtual worlds is that immersive experiences can grow and develop. They're already built in VR worlds. You don't get to contribute and change them and everybody contribute together. So. They, they're not really as dynamic in their ability to grow. Um, and then think about this sense of presence. Have you thought about when I first got in a virtual world like Second Life, when I used that little slider in the map to look at how big the world was, and I saw the mainland and all these little continents and all these little parcels, and it was like, this place is gigantic, like the world. And you get this sense of presence in a large, this gigantic world. Well, in a headset, you don't really get that sense of presence. You get the sense of presence of being in this contained space. 
not saying that that's good or bad, it's just different. And there may be advantages and disadvantages to that. Um, let's look at the headset such as VR, Oculus, um, Samsung. One of the different things there is developers build. Now, there's nothing wrong with that because developers can build some awesome experiences in VR, but it's a different type of creativity that, you know, unless you know Unity or you know uh, Unreal Engine, you know, the, it, it's, it, it separates the user from the creativity. Um, another, I think, um, I don't know if it's an advantage or a disadvantage. So maybe it could be a, an advantage, but there, you come in with numerous identities. I think children growing up are pretty used to that because when they go in Minecraft or they play any kind of um, games, they often take on different avatars, identities. But for education, for us, it's been important to have an educator persistent virtual identity. And um, I think a lot of us try to carry that over right into the VR headset environments. Um, yes, and uh, Day, I have tried a little bit of building in alt space, and then of course Sansar does as well. But um, it doesn't seem to have all of the tools and interface that, um, that Second Life does, of course. So we've talked about um, that comfort level for most people, 30 minutes or less, but it could, you know, give or take that. Um, I do think that um, a lot of these new tools right now are less community oriented. Perhaps in the future, they'll become more community oriented. Their communities are built outside the VR experience in places like Discord. That's why a lot of us have joined Discord. But that disadvantage is it's so cumbersome to have to build more and more communities with more and more um, communication channels to have to keep up with. Wasn't it nice when we only had Second Life and all you had was those communities and they sent out notices and we could keep up a little bit? We can't keep up anymore. So yes, there's that cognitive, you know, overload of so many communities that we're going to have to really think about in the future how to solve that. And I think it's important that we think of that as an obstacle because learning communities are a great, great resource. And if we can't find them and build them, there'll be a big loss. And then I mentioned already that the, the, immers the immersive experiences um, often in the VR spaces can be what I call disposable. They're just meant to be experienced one time. And I also sometimes feel a little bit confined in space in the headset. Um, I don't know, does anybody feel, else feel that? Uh, type a Y in text chat if you ever feel a little confined. You're, you're in this space and you just use it for a little while, but it's not really as open where you can just fly and go wherever you want in this great big world. So um, uh, I don't know if that will change in the, in the future or not, but uh, there's, there's just quite a few different advantages and dis disadvantages when we hear about it. I'm gonna look in the ch text chat and see if I, if I missed anything there. Right, where uh, people are talking about Discord and how, yes, the communication channels can get a little bit overwhelming. Um, and we're, we're all going to have to think about that in education in, in the future. And it's a struggle because we don't all use Facebook or Twitter. We don't all use, uh, of course, we can't use Google Plus anymore. That's why a lot of us went to Discord. But there are other, you know, social channels coming up that educators are using, but we don't all use the same ones. So that, um, that can be very difficult. Uh, yes, I was asking if headsets feel confining to anyone, and uh, I think uh, for some people they can feel that way. The gentleman who I told you is a Hollywood producer, who I let him try it on, and just looking at the demo, the Oculus demo, where you go into a museum, a dinosaur comes toward you, um, he, he like pushed around and like bumped into his suitcase, <laughs> because it's like, you know, you're, you're sort of in a space that you think you feel like it's real, but then you're kind of bumping into the real world. I've even heard of a few injuries where people got carried away and they, or they broke their TV screen because they kind of crashed into it. So, you know, there are, uh, that sense of space, you know, can be um, different when you're completely confined within your virtual reality headset. So, um, is there a place for both of these worlds as we look at these advantages and disadvantages? I really feel like there is a place for both. 
they think the issue is really about funding. Um, imagine what VR and v virtual worlds could be like if education spent the money on virtual reality and virtual worlds as much as they do on standardized testing. Um, I think there are still a lot of administrators in education that just don't see the big picture of how virtual en environments can be greatly beneficial education. Um, and I believe that they will at some point. But I do think that there, um, there's a place for both of these kinds of environments. I hope that both virtual worlds on a desktop and virtual reality on a headset will remain options in the future. So back to that concept that all of us here, I think, find as one of the biggest advantages in virtual worlds where users can create their own avatars and their own user-generated content and import it. Um, here's just a little snapshot of my avatar with my books on my head. I tried to create that in several virtual worlds, um, OpenSim, Avicon, uh, Kitely, and just kind of build my own books to stick on top of my head. And the reason I did was because if you're recognizable and you um, have people can see you and they know who you are, you're building that trust with your colleagues. You're building that authenticity. Many of you know um, Renee Brock, Zinnia in, in Second Life and other worlds. Zinnia does a lot of presentations on authentic avatars and the importance of that as digital citizens. And the concept of personal branding that recognizability that we can have. Yes, Zinnia is always easily recognizable. In fact, I've met her in the, in the physical world and she looks exactly like her avatar. She even has some clothes that are made out of the same fabrics, the fabrics that she's brought into Second Life. To, so she kind of goes above and beyond with her authentic digital identity. But what I want to point out here is that um, it's important even for young students because we, when we talk about digital citizenship, we're te teaching K-12 students that they leave digital footprints whenever they're online. They need to think about their digital identity and what they're putting online. And I think when we create an authentic, trustworthy avatar, we're advocating that the importance of digital footprints and authentic digital identity. And so that's just something we can do to teach students the importance of their digital footprints. How many of you use the same name in your various virtual environments? Type a Y in the text chat if you try to use the same name or if you try to look at all these Ys. I mean, all of you as educators, I think, agree in the important importance of personal branding. Um, and LV is mentioning Selby talking about that. Everywhere I go in virtual worlds, I bump into Selby Evans. He's a champion of virtual worlds. And uh, his identity is the same everywhere he goes, thinkerer. And the um, ISTE uh, award, you know, for um, the thinkerer award, named after thinkerer Evans, champion of virtual worlds. So yes, um, I think uh, it's, we all agree that this concept of digital identity is really, really important in virtual worlds. Uh, and I think as we bring new educators into virtual environments, we need to stress that right up front. It's a little difficult with the VR headset when you can't customize your avatar, though. Because, and you also, one of the tools that I really loved about being in a virtual world early on was being able to right click on the person, take notes where I met the person, Look at what groups they're involved in. Hey, this person's interested in all the same things that I'm interested in. And when I first did that, I, I could build a community because I could write. And I, I went out into the real world. It kind of blew my mind. And I thought, oh, I went to a virtual a, a physical conference. And I thought, oh, I wish I could right click on these people and learn about them. You know, because you have to actually walk up to the person. And you can't walk up to everybody and have private conversations in the physical world with everyone. But you can in a virtual world. And you can right click and, and learn about them, take notes, and, may, and really build a professional network that is valuable. Well, that profile feature is a huge advantage that, that, that we're used to and that's helped us with our professional networking. 
So I think digital identity, this slide here, I really want to stress. It's, it's really a, a huge advantage that, that we've had, and I hope that VR communities will pick up on that in the future. We have a lot of obstacles ahead, so let's think a couple about a couple of these obstacles that we are facing. First of all, we don't even know what headsets, the VR headsets, are doing to the human brain. Now, I'm not too worried about it because at, at my age, I figure, you know, um, it's okay. I'm not going to be in there more than 45 minutes. I'm careful. I'm not going to crash into my, my, my screen. I'm cautious. But um, young children, they don't even know what it does to a young child's brain. Um, and then another thing that I've found is a lot of, I've, a lot of these demos I've gone to, I'll say, I'm here for education. Do any of your developers have things for education? Most of them don't. They're gamers that are creating zombie environments. I've, I've killed a lot of zombies, trust me. And, and even the ones that are so-called educational, many times there is nobody with any type of educational background creating the app or the, or the world. That it's just because they've embedded some educational world, um, words and um, picked here and there at some curriculum. They call it educational. There are not hard, um, really high quality standards yet for VR platforms to create education in VR. So, you know, that's, a, that's another obstacle that, that we face. Um, and then we think about how do we advocate virtual, virtual environments? When they're coming, we have all these obstacles and we're trying to get administration to buy into it, we really need to document what we've done in order to, uh, and, and to show what are the learning objectives, what are the, um, what, how do we assess outcomes of students. Um, all of this is really going to have to be documented before we can bring, a, we can really advocate for virtual environments in the future. Not to say that some of those VR experiences wouldn't be beneficial, like going in the human body, going in, go, you know, we can, we can really utilize those, but um, we need to be cautious on how long students are going to be using those uh, before we really advocate using them. Then we still have that, we still have that huge obstacle of training can be complex. When you bring somebody into a virtual world, so many times they, they're, the problem is, this is way too hard. I don't have time to learn this. Um, teachers, you know, they have a lot on their hands with grading and parent conferences and curriculum changes and all the things that they deal with day to day to spend their own time outside of class to learn these virtual environments. That's still an obstacle that we face. And now there are so many virtual worlds. The Community Virtual Library has a branch in Second Life, Kitely. Um, we have one at Avacon. We have one in several um, web-based worlds, 3D web worlds, Cyber Lounge. Am I expecting to bring teachers into all of these spaces? No, um, but I am going to explore them, try to find the best practices, and document what I've been doing. But look at that next point. What an obstacle we have with too many tools, way too many technology tools. Millions of apps are available. And how do we train teachers on finding the best ones? And now all these virtual environments that are available. So I think all of you here listening to me, you are the early pioneer explorers that are challenged to find the best virtual environments. And when you find those best virtual environments, you can share them with each other, and that will be able to lay the path for others. But it's not an easy road. You have a huge job ahead of you. Um, I already mentioned the many so-called educational apps and environments that are not really created by trained professionals. I got ahead of myself on that one. But identifying the best practices is going to require an enormous effort and an enormous amount of time ex um, exploring all of these changing spaces, even when you learn one. It changes, you know, that's just, you know, that's the, the new learning hierarchy, and, and we're all used to that. As Alvin, Alvin Toffler said, um, uh, people that are, that are uh, illiterate in the future, they're not going to be the ones who can't read. They're going to be the ones who can't learn, unlearn, and relearn, because flexibility is, t you know, top dog of the learning skills now.
I mentioned that VR might not be so good for developing brains. I'm going to give you a YouTube that's got a little research on that, so you can look at that later, just as an example. Because this study showed it had a kindergartner using VR. She loved it. She was very excited. She thought it was awesome. Um, they've done a study with kindergartners, and those kindergartners later, they could not tell the difference between physical memories and virtual reality memories as being real. Because in their mind, they were both real. And so that, you know, that's really different than when we were growing up and we were watching TV cartoons. I mean, you know, when you're, when you're distance from that screen, you know the difference between reality and virtual reality. Even on the, one of the very first VR um, experiences that we ever had was the old um, screen, uh, what's that screen, screen master, your view master. And you'd slide the little view master slide on the, and it would, you know, you could look in and see this 3D, you know, that's considered the, one of the first VR platforms. We knew that wasn't real, but it's really realistic on a VR headset. And we really need to think about what that's doing to young children. So I mentioned the challenge for all of you here is to document our progress. It's not an easy thing to do. We're, it, it takes so much time to learn all these different environments, to go to the conferences where we can see the best practices, like the great conference that's coming up next month in March, Virtual World's Best Practices in Education. Um, we need to document all of these things. And how can we do it? Well, I hope a lot of you are taking photos, finding places to archive those photos, uh, whether it's Flickr, Pinterest, or your own blogs, or uh, in the cloud, wherever you're, you're documenting them. And of course, machinima. A lot of us are learning now. Um, I, my early machinima are so, like, they're so, like, grainy. And, but they really kind of document my journey from the beginning. So documenting through Machinima, and, and we live stream now a lot of events. If we can save these uh, Machinima recordings, that will document how educators pave the way for the future of virtual environments. Saving our chat logs, of course. Um, sure, it's cumbersome, but it is important archival for the future. And uh, the Community Virtual Library in Kitely, at our branch in Kitely, we have an underwater archival room. And we're trying to put underwater down there in the archival room lots of ways to archive virtual worlds. And even how to um, how to maybe store some of the files like OR files, how to share them, and just different ways to archive because it's important that we do that, as well as how to archive for digital legacy when um, when someone passes away. What happens to the virtual content that they created? We need to think about that or it's lost for the future. So those are some of the jobs that librarians have in the future. Virtual environment archival um, and the many different things that that you know, will address. We need to be researching uh, like Lear here is doing, writing research papers. Many of you here have contributed to research papers, journal, journal articles, or conferences that document our progress and our research. If you type a Y in the text chat, if you've presented on virtual environments at conferences, or if you've done a research article or a book chapter, let's see how many Ys we get on people who are trying to document their, and even just documenting your progress with an article on what you've contributed in a virtual world as an educator, that contributes to the research and the progress of virtual environments for education. Or if you have um, a blog, yes, the virtual environment, uh, virtual education journal. Um, there are several journals out there that where we have documented the, the various um, events and workshops and um, presentations and conferences that, that sort of uh, document our progress. And this slide shows um, that boat that's up on the right hand slide, that's some uh, OR files that we are docu that we are um, putting in our underwater archival room so that we can learn how to how to archive some of the actual content that is created by virtual world artists. And then there's a there's a photo there of Cyber Lounge. You may reckon you may recognize the avatar in Cyber Lounge documenting the difference between headsets virtual worlds that are client-based, where you download the software like Second Life or uh, that need a viewer, or web-based worlds like Cyber Lounge. 
documenting all these worlds is important so that we can evaluate the differences um, in, in all of these different places. Got a little bibliography um, here. I I just want to ask as you're as you're um, as we're winding up, how many of you agree with this? I'm going to put a statement here in the text chat so you can actually read it. Got two two statements here. Our current state. Where are we right now? As we think about that, and then as we con contemplate, where are we headed? I'd like to say that virtual worlds have been proven to be valuable for education. Virtual reality headsets need more research for long-term use. Um, and I'd just like to know if you, if you agree with that, if you type a Y on those two, um, where we are right now, those two statements. And um, personally, I'm, I'm very hopeful about the future. Um, I feel like the time that we have spent in virtual worlds has been, so far today, has been amazing and has been well worth the effort. Um, I'm hopeful about the future, even though we have huge challenges ahead, I'm, because I'm hopeful that as we see these different tools, we're beginning to understand the importance of balancing. And that balance requires balance of not stressing out over too much, too much information, not stressing out over too many worlds that we're juggling. But taking a break, you know, and appreciating the physical world, going out to the beach and to collect rocks and to take hikes and to just breathe and enjoy the beautiful world we live in, and then come back and really focus on the best to offer in virtual spaces instead of walking down the street with a cell phone scrolling, delete, 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 or sitting on the bus with it, you know, you see so many people staring at a screen, just deleting, deleting, deleting. I don't want to waste time doing that. If I'm going to go into a virtual space, I want to go in with a clear purpose and with intent for learning and for collaborating that doesn't waste my time. And then I can balance virtual and physical because that's important for the future. So I hope that you um, appreciate that importance too and look and strive for balance as we continue to learn in these spaces. And I really hope that I will see you all um, at the Virtual World's Best Practices in Education Con Conference um, uh, coming up 2020 Stellar. <laughs> and uh, I'll be at several presentations there, including the one that Lear mentioned for the Nonprofit Commons. The Community Virtual Library has a couple of different presentations, one kind of on this topic about virtual reality. And then Vacara has one. Vacara, the Virtual Center for Archives and Record, um, Records Administration, they have some librarians going out to research and uh, come up with a lot more detailed advantages of the different VR headset social environments. So you might want to come to that one. They're, they're actually conducting some research um, in virtual environments currently right now. So I am, um, I, they're not going to actually do the Smackdown this time, Beth, um, I don't think, but We've had a lot of comments about really liking the SmackDown for VR because it was it was really fun and immersive to watch the um, avatars fighting and you know I served as the as the ref and they were in the fighting boxing ring and I think it was a good use of a virtual environment and any time that we get feedback on on a presentation that's really good use of a virtual environment we want to document that so we can show people you know this is this is deep learning this is this engages people into real critical thinking and that's you know i, I think that's important for all of us to um to do so we will look at at, um, at doing more presentations like that and i'm going to open up for um, any questions going to jump in here. I, my brain is full, but several things you said really uh, I kind of resonate with. Can you hear me okay? Yes, hear you great. I'm going to turn my mic off while you're talking. So, uh, first, mea culpa, I have never ever worn a VR headset, although I've watched a lot of two videos about them, and the best one in my mind was the one where they put two cross treads at 90 degree angles to each other so you could walk forward on the 
and backward and then you could if you turn and started going sideways the tread mill you're on moved left and right it was confusing as heck for the to vlogger at first um, they had to have safety rails so they wouldn't fall off but it was astonishing to watch that the way they walked wearing a virtual reality headset drove the the two crosswise conveyor belts under them i hope you can visualize what i'm talking about so to me, that was like the most extreme example to date I've seen of trying to use VR to emulate ER, physical reality. Um, so that triggered as you spoke. Um, I really love your diagrams comparing the headset and the virtual worlds. I remember going to a business networking meeting years ago and telling somebody at the table about I work in virtual reality and I could show them on my website and they said do I have to get special glasses for that and at first it was like what is he talking about and then I realized he thought it was the red and green glasses which was the old version um, I, I agree with you I, I get as lost looking at Second Life or looking at your avatar right now with blonde hair then I tab over and I see your Venn conference and you have blonde hair except you have a ponytail to me, I'm already living in multiple virtual worlds already always. And um, so I kind of resonated when you said that um, back there, you said that somewhere in there, it was good. Um, I like your, I liked a lot of what you said. I just really appreciate it. Thank you for really triggering an avalanche of thoughts in my head. Uh, people in virtual reality don't know about virtual worlds. Absolutely. Um, and the other thing, I, I have several projects in play and I'm not going to talk about them, but this really feeds into it and your diagrams are especially helpful to me because I'm a systems analyst. That's my, that's my profession and everything. Once it gets into a diagram, I can begin to feel like a grasp on it. And you've given me a way to look at VR headsets and virtual worlds. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you for that great feedback. Yes. And I, I really hope your takeaway is that it is, important for us to work together and document all of this and really strive for the critical thinking, deep learning and, and how to show that educational value. Um, that's that's really our, our big challenge. And of course, promote virtual worlds right now because they're they're tried and true where uh, where VR, I think we need to explore, but we we do need to be cautious. Well, well, can I throw in a couple of comments here? First of all, I mentioned the Grand Canyon Sim, and when I, I was in a conference with um, the uh, National Park Service one night and the American Geological Institute, and I point blank turned to these guys and I said, how do you feel about doing virtual reality? And a guy from the American Geological Institute said, well, our research, and there is research on this, has shown that people that go in and they do a geological simulation like are more likely to want to go to the actual place and see it in real life, uh, which I was so surprised at that because it sort of uh, sort of piques their curiosity. The other thing is, I would argue in some cases, VR is better than real life. For example, um, if I want to take my students to the Grand Canyon, I got a choice. Mm, let's see, I put a headset on them, in which case they can actually fly around the canyon. They get real time information as they're moving around the canyon. As I said, things like the elevation, the geologic formations, the fossils, or do I take them to the Grand Canyon, right, in Arizona, which is extremely expensive, uh, time intensive, they get there, unless I rent a helicopter, they can't fly around, uh, right, it could be too dangerous in some cases, um, and they don't necessarily get the real life information. When you hike in the canyon, it, you're lucky if it tells you the age, oh, this is Ordovician, Silurian, and so on, and I did it, I didn't see a single fossil when I went up and down. So there's, there are some cases where the VR situation is better than real life. So it's, and the other thing we're looking at is memorable. We're learning that students forget a lot of what they learn with just traditional lecture and so on. Um, virtual worlds or virtual reality, I think is more memorable, at least is for me and my students. So I think there's a lot of benefits out there. Exactly. And even in virtual worlds, which are part of VR, uh, there are some things that you can do that would just simply be too dangerous 
uh, in the physical world or would be impossible. Like, I don't know if any of you ever went to Cooper Macbeth's uh, math exhibit where he rezzed a million cubes and you could walk inside them. As a first grade teacher years ago, I couldn't spill a million cubes, cubes out in my classroom. We wouldn't have time to pick them up before recess. <laughs> you know? So yeah, there's some things you just simply can't do in a physical world. I mean, in a, in a virtual world, you can do it, but you can't do it in the physical world. Does Doug have a question? Or is his hand just up? Yes, this is Doug Hohulen. Um, just wanted to make a comment. I work for Nokia, and uh, we're uh, using VR. Um, actually, where we before we put in a cell site, we actually do a, an inspection of the cell site in virtual reality. So kind of a digital twinning. Um, so we just before we're ready to begin the work, we do a VR inspection, and it lets us do the work uh, actually fifty percent faster. So th this is an example of you know when you do something virtually, then you're ready to do it in the in in the real world. How um, you can be much more efficient. Great example. I can see many professional examples for VR that uh, certainly adults are ready to do right now. I, when I mention being cautious, I'm really talking about more of the K-12 environment, and it's. I think there's still important. Um, educational purposes for the headsets right right now teachers are using the google cardboard in class they just need to use it wisely cautiously and you know for a certain amount of time my son doesn't want my three-year-old grandson to see that i have an oculus he's like please never show him that you know he's just way too young because he would want to do it and it we don't know what it would do you know that's kind of scary Anybody else have a question? And uh, I didn't know if Gabe had anything else to say. I know you were uh, mentioned something earlier. Is there anybody else who has something they need to ask? Um, I, I didn't have anything I, I needed to ask per se. I, th I thought your presentation was great. I know that um, there's, a, there's a plan around me potentially giving a, a very quick little presentation here, but I, I know this has been a, a long event. I, if, if this feels like a good time to wrap it up, that, that's also fine with me too. So. Happy to, to leave that in, in all of your hands. Yeah, I just wanted to thank Bell here. <clears throat> yeah, and I wanted to say, I think I saw Gabe in one of uh, <clears throat> Bell's slides, the one about alt space educators. <laughs> you caught <laughs> that. I caught that too. <laughs> I was like, in there, yep. He's famous. <laughs> <laughs> Gabe, you made it. People are passing your name around. <laughs> cool, yeah. cool. Okay, I'm going to um, mute my mic now, Gabe. The floor is yours. I think. Do you, do you need the presentation more? Uh, yeah, that'd be great. I'll just throw something quick up here, and I'll I'll, I'll really kind of compress this down. I'll, I'll try to keep it like ten, 10 minutes, if that's okay with all of you. Beautiful. Thank you. Valerie, you might need to remove your phone of the You already did. Look at you. All right. Can you all see uh, what's what's up here? Yep. All right. Sweet. So, uh, really quick, kind of lightning background about me. I'm a I'm a former teacher. I used to teach Latin in Los Angeles. I love all stuff uh, ancient. <laughs> and uh, after that, I went to UCSB where I did my master's research on teachers and students using virtual worlds. Um, many of you uh, have been in this space for quite some time. Um, doing my research primarily on Second Life. Uh, after that, I had my own little entrepreneurial journey where I set out to make uh, a virtual world that was specifically geared for the needs of teachers and students. We did uh, okay, but never had uh, commercial success, so kind of moved on from that. After that, I was head of education at a startup called WorldBiz, and now finally I am here at Verbella, where I help out a bit on uh, the Verbella website, but I also do some uh, product development at Verbella, and, and my focus specifically is on what's called WebXR. And what I'm going to give you just a quick introduction to is, is not really just the product that I'm working on, um, but the technology that's that's behind it, this thing, WebXR and, and the immersive web. So what is uh, WebXR? 
you know, uh, many of you know both of these terms, right? The web, uh, of course, is the internet. It's, it's what you access from a web browser. And XR is kind of this overarching constellation term for all sorts of uh, immersive stuff, whether it's VR, AR, uh, what have you. Um, WebXR is a new way to build immersive experiences that run right from a browser. So this is like XR on the web. Um, this new API makes it possible for a web browser to communicate with a VR headset that's plugged into your computer. Or if you're on a standalone device like the Oculus Quest and you open the Oculus browser application and navigate to a WebXR website, it gives you the option to expand it and experience it in full immersive mode as if it were a native VR application. So why does WebXR exist? You know, on the one hand, browsers are powerful, and companies like Google and Apple, they invest uh, millions of dollars every year to continue making their web browsers uh, incredibly good platforms to deliver a wide variety of content, and they keep getting better, and they're going to keep getting better. Also, one thing people like about websites and browser-based applications is that there's no app node install, walled garden, special app store. And it's it's all built on um, open standards. There's there's not uh, like companies that have vested interests in uh, things that they're trying to sell you uh, as 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 it, they're not the ones in charge of web standards as they evolve. So I got really interested in WebXR uh, about two years ago um, because I'm a I, having been in the ed tech space for a while, I, I've always seen the barrier to the download and install in, in a lot of different educational contexts. I also see a lot of people on, on Chromebooks who, who don't have access to a lot of the cool immersive stuff um, coming out right now. So, you know, when I say WebXR, I, I, I am interested in the headset stuff, but it's also just important to keep in mind that this stuff just runs on desktop. Uh, without any VR headset. It runs just as a 3D experience in the browser. Um, and it also works on mobile, just right from a, a mobile browser. So why does all this uh, matter? So when I think about the philosophy of the web, there's there's a lot that I like about it. And, and I know a lot of people in the immersive tech space, they're talking about this term, the metaverse. Everyone wants to see the metaverse built, which is this like interconnected, navigable information system where you can jump from one space to another and it's all interconnected and the metaverse is in some ways like i think it already exists right it's it's the internet like the infrastructure for the metaverse already lives and and it's it's the web um the the url system of the internet essentially is the metaverse it's that uh navigable information infrastructure where everything is interconnected and can be connected with a link uh, any website can be a portal to another website now before webxr it was kind of a, a flat metaverse. So some people say, well, it's not really the metaverse because you're just looking at 2D pages. But now with WebXR, I really think that it won't be any company that builds the metaverse. The internet and the web browser will be uh, the true immersive metaverse. So another thing that I really love about WebXR beyond that stuff is the approachability of creating WebXR content. So I know many of the presenters here have mentioned Unity, and I'm a big Unity fan. And this, the platform we're using now is built with Unity, and Unity is incredible. It's incredibly powerful. But often opening up Unity 3D for the first time is a bit of a challenge for uh, not just, uh, students and teachers alike, right? It's a, it's a complicated user interface. There's a real learning curve there. But with WebXR, you can build immersive experiences um, with either, you know, you can use no code tools, but if you do jump into the coding side of it, you're using things like HTML and JavaScript and kind of, in my opinion, what are kind of easier, more accessible web development tools. And to give you an example of this, so this is uh, an example. If you look on the right, it's just like a very simple scene with a few shapes, right? And then if you look on the left, you can see the code that creates this scene. And at first, it just looks like a bunch of gibberish, but, but I encourage you to kind of zoom in and just set, kind of try to make your way through it, right? You see a box, it's like that's an HTML tag. And then within the box, you see HTML attributes, height, width, position, and color. And you define all of those things. And then you see, oh, and there's a sphere, and there's a cylinder. And it's, it's a very bare bones example, this one, because it's just a very simple scene. But in some ways, I think that this kind of code is, is quite approachable because you could do something like just have your students remix, remix this website. There's a service called Glitch that lets you quickly like remix uh, sites and there's an, 
there's a WebXR starter project for Glitch where you could just click a button and then you've got this and then you can just adjust the values. And I, I've had a lot of luck with students in the past where I just say, look, just go in. It doesn't matter if you can't make sense of everything, but just try to change the color of the stuff that you see. Ch you know, change the color of the box. Oh, I think that it just, <laughs> it just took us to the, uh, the browser just took us to the uh, A-frame glitch. So you get a sense of it, but um, I'm not sure exactly why it did that. And I'll try to move back. I clicked on the link. Sorry about that. Oh, no, no problem. You're fine. I'm going to try to just navigate back. There we go. We're all good. Uh, I'm glad that you were so excited about it that you wanted to click on it. But I encourage you, uh, I'll share these links with all of you after this, and, and you'll be off to the races. Um, so yeah, and al although this is a simple example, you know, already someone just working with this after a bit, before they know it, uh, they'll have they'll know like what an HTML tag is, right? That's what a box is doing here. They'll know what an attribute is. And then these are the building blocks that you can use to create increasingly more complicated stuff. For those that are interested, I have made a, a series of five like project-based learning tutorials that take people truly from scratch. I mean, you don't need to have written a line of HTML in your life. And by the end of it, you'll, you've created an immersive website that has 3D models, 360 photos, images, and so forth. And what's cool about your creation at the end is that it, not only will it be something that you've made, but it'll be something that works on desktop, mobile, and every VR headset out there. So I think that's just incredibly powerful. I'm convinced that this is a super powerful medium for students and teachers to dive into uh, immersive creation and uh, getting their feet wet for the very first time with basic, basic coding skills. All right. Um, this, the 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 tool I was using there to build kind of the web development framework is called A Frame, but there are other tools out there that you can use. This just uh, hang on a second. I feel like I need to maybe take ownership of the board just to prevent accidental clicks. Yeah, through. yeah, Gabe, we've all yep. taken ownership, so that would be good. <laughs> okay, cool, got it. Um, if you're looking for more complicated tooling as well, it's out there. And, and as I said, there's also like no no code WebXR creation tools as well. Um, I mentioned my series of tutorials. The link for that, uh, I'll put it here in the text chat, but it's learn.framevr.io. All right. Okay, I'm gonna rip through this. We don't need to dive into each of those other tools. So cool examples of WebXR out there in the wild right now. You know, it is very new technology. Um, Chrome has like just adopted the standard. Uh, it works on Safari, although still some kinks to work out on Safari. But some stuff that's out there that already I think demonstrates that the technology is viable and incredibly powerful. On the one hand, there's Mozilla Hubs, which is a very fantastic collaboration platform, cross 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 platform. And I think Mozilla Hubs is is definitely up there. It's sort of best of class in, in the in the high tier of uh, immersive collaboration tools. And it runs right from a web they build with WebXR. And in fact they build using the same tools that you saw with that very simple scene with the shapes. <laughs> it's that same technology just on a much more uh, grand scale. Uh, some of you might know Sketchfab. So Sketchfab is the biggest repository of 3D models online. And right from Sketchfab, you can view their models in really crisp detail right from the browser. And Sketchfab uses WebXR for that kind of rendering uh, under the hood. And Sketchfab is just awesome. Uh, tons of downloadable models, tons of, tons of awesome paid models as well. Uh, for those that want to browse their store, but loads of stuff you can get on there for free. And their rendering engine is very sophisticated. I mean, you can look at a model of an airplane in, in, in incredible detail right from the browser, and it's because they use WebXR. Mozilla also recently made an experience that, that is really intended to show the state of the art of what you can build with, with WebXR, and it's called Hello WebXR. It's, a, it's, a, it's great, especially right from the Quest, to sort of showcase what you can do with the Oculus Quest hardware. Um, the Quest, by the way, pretty much has the processing power of a mobile phone. And to see Hello WebXR running from that, right from the Oculus browser, is, is really stunning. And then a project that I'm working on uh, is called Frame. It's from Verbella. The link is just framevr.io. And it's a very simple multi-user browser-based collaboration tool that lets you create simple scenes, share a link, 
meet inside of there with other people. You can talk, you can look at 360 photos, you can, you can bring in 3D models and place them where you want. You can kind of set up different scenes. And one of the angles of frame that we're going for is really trying to rethink delivering an immersive presentation. So if you think about PowerPoint, like what I'm using now, you know, I'm navigating through these slides as I tell a story about whatever it is I'm talking about. It could be your product, your business, your subject. But in frame, you set up different scenes and then we have tools that make it easy for you to navigate through those different scenes that you've set up so that you can sort of tell an immersive presentation using uh, the different scenes in your frame. Frame, the caveat here is that it is in beta and you're gonna run into some hiccups. There's no doubt about it. That said, um, I know this is a pioneering crew. You often have uh, uh, a, a certain kind of patience that has evolved over the years with these tools. Um, you're used to running into stuff. So you, you in particular, I'd be very grateful to get your feedback on uh, framevr.io. When you first go there, it's kind of a homepage-like experience. And then you, you can click the Get Started button and uh, you can create your own frames and then you can invite others to them. A little tutorial runs when you first create your own frame, but in any case, if you, if you do dive in there, I'd be happy to meet you inside a frame to show you around the capabilities and uh, give you kind of a personal tour if, if you'd like. And if you want to set that up, don't, don't be shy. You can just email me at gbaker at um, It's evolving rapidly, so we, we just put out a massive update uh, last week, and there's another one coming in, in two weeks' time. I know the avatars are just little robots. For this, I'll shut my mouth about frame. We're going to have more like humanoid looking avatars coming soon. But in the meantime, I think you'll get a kick out of what you see there. All right, let me rip to the last slide. So in closing, you know, I think about the nature of a website. Right now, when most people think website, I think what comes to mind is um, a relatively static 2D page, like a screen on a panel. But I, I really think that WebXR is going to take off and that as the immersive web grows, our idea of what comes to mind when we think of website is really gonna change and, and evolve with it. And the way I think about this sometimes is when I think about the word site in isolation, like when it's used not in a context of website, I think most people actually think of a location. You know, it's like, let's head to this site or think about, let's go to this archeological site. It's really a place, a place that you can navigate to and a place that you can navigate throughout. It's a position in space. And I think that as WebXR takes off, I think of website and site are really kind of going to coalesce, right? We're going to think of a website as, as a place, possibly in space, right? And when we think about the metaverse, uh, all of these immersive websites will be linked via the metaverse that already exists, which is the connected infrastructure of the web and the link platform, the URL. And then in closing, right, learning how to build these cross-platform sites, I think is a very compelling and accessible way for teachers and students to learn some basic coding and design skills. So for all those above reasons, I'm really into WebXR. I'm really grateful that Verbella gives me the, the, vet, the kind of avenue to explore WebXR and build WebXR products here within the company. And um, yeah, just grateful. I hope I kept that within a, a good time, uh, time limit there, but grateful for all of your ears today. That was awesome, Gabe. Do you want to, oh, does anybody have any questions? Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I just, I just bolted to my seat. Any, uh, any questions? <laughs> I thought, I think Day had a really great question just above about um, navigating within the environment within WebXR. Yeah, so it's, it's sort of in the hands of the developers to decide how they want to handle this. The way that we do it in Frame is if you're accessing it from a browser without a headset, you can use the arrow key SD for navigation. To rotate your viewpoint, you can click and drag the mouse to look around, or you can use the Q and E keys to rotate left or right. On mobile, it's a bit trickier because we want to make sure that people can still click in the environment. We used to have a system where you just tapped and it would move you forward. It was kind of simple, but it made it hard to then actually click and interact with things in the scene. So on mobile, on frame, on the bottom left, there's a little like thing that looks like a joystick and you just tap and kind of scoot it around and it will move you around. So mobile, and then to look around on mobile, you can just tap and swipe anywhere else or just rotate your phone, which is kind of cool. And then in VR, uh, you can either just walk around, of course, uh, or you can use one of the joysticks on the VR controllers. Nice. And Andy, did you have a question? Thank <laughs> you. 
I have, I have a question that Natalia just told me to speak up. So, uh, first of all, I agree with what you just said, Smith. My brain is full. I want to be excused, but this question has been one I came in with. So, it's for it's for Gabe and it's for Natalia. Um, I came in to check Bella out about two months ago from an article I ran across in a Google search. And I was intrigued. Um, I can't, especially after this conference where you have graciously allowed ISTV and who I never heard of until in, in worlds. I thought, I mean, it's me projecting from my old job. Bella is okay, it's a corporate site it's really pushing hard for virtual business meetings in team rooms online where you can all come in and have corporate meetings and talk about projections and sales which is fine i've been in that myself and here i come and you guys are like passionate about education and learning and how this applies and you work for this company that i thought only cared about you know <laughs> so what 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 is where is Verbella going from your guys' point of view? It intrigues me. Um, it's part of Singularity Hub, whatever that is, and I'm just interested in kind of what is the meta context for the way you guys see it. That's it. Yeah, N Natalia, is it okay if I tackle this one? Absolutely. Cool. So you know, ed education has long been a part of Verbella's sort of lifeblood, I think, and and uh, starting you know. A number of years back, we've had clients like Stanford University. They have a private campus, which is a, a version of the open campus here that's just for them, but it's kind of custom built and has particular features and designs. It looks a bit like Stanford's actual campus. Um, so that kind of distance education component, I think, has been in years past even a bigger aspect of our business than the corporate collaboration uh, side of it. Now, recently, as you've picked up on lots of messaging we have out there, we're, we're trying to uh, go further in the kind of corporate remote work space because we see this trend of remote work uh, at the at the at the macro level is just going to be growing. You know, it's been growing the past five years. Um, certain recent things, you know, current events are causing a, a spike in it with the with the coronavirus has caused a lot of eyes to go on this problem now. But in any case, I think at, at the at the kind of projections level, we, we think that there's a big opportunity for Verbella in the remote workspace, but we, 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 it's kind of a dual approach. You know, we have a lot of focus still on education. Um, a lot of our messaging uh, is targeted for the education space. Uh, people like Natalia and I on the team, we are really passionate about it as are many others. So the chance to work with and help is, is something that we are always happy to do. So yeah, it's it's we we do a bit of both. I think um, whether down the road we end up like, like picking one or the other and really focusing on that, I think remains to be seen. But for now, we we sort of embrace both of those markets. Um, with you know, it's interesting. We're, we're, we've been seeing interest even besides the higher education. We've been seeing interest in K twelve yeah. as well. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Go yeah, for it, no, I was just going to say that that's actually come up a lot today, um, just in the questions about how can we create environments that are are accessible for K through 12 and um, that supports not just, you know, the creating the, the presence, right, in the physical space that we've recreated through virtual reality, but also integrating, you know, again, these other sort of role playing dynamics that are available by utilizing um, what uh, was it Mary? Was it Mary who was talking about it earlier? And how you can create those role playing spaces um, by building them and then from there having the students interact with each other and learn more about what certain experiences are like by living through them as they engage in these really different environments like going back to the 1930s for instance so yeah really interesting uh, potential there 